Hey guys, in this video I'm talking about five essential Asperger's symptoms in toddlers that you definitely need to check out. All that's coming up. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the Aspie world. My name is Dan. I have autism, ADHD, OCD and dyslexia and I make weekly videos on this type of content. So if you're new around here and you'd like to learn more about that, make sure to hit the subscribe button by clicking on the notification bell down below. And also if you're watching over on Facebook, be sure to give this page a like and a follow to see more videos just like this one. Right then, guys, what is going on Different Thinking Farm where we think differently daily? This is the Aspie world. What up? Yo, so. Before we do anything else, I want to tell you that I have a free PDF book all about seven autism life hacks that are going to save you time, money, everything. It's going to be awesome. Go check out the book. It's for free. You can download it for free. The link will be in the description below and on the end slate and in the account above here. But for now, let's get on with this video. Okay, so I wanted to talk about Asperger's in toddlers. Now, Asperger's syndrome is autism. It had a name change in 2013 to Autism Spectrum Disorder, but Asperger's still is diagnosed in some parts of the world, so this is why I'm using it. And also, the word symptoms isn't something that we typically talk about when we're talking about a condition that is neurological or neurodevelopmental like autism, because symptoms, obviously, if something is symptomatic, and if something is symptomatic, then you can cure it, but autism is not something you can cure and is not symptomatic. These are actually traits and characteristics of behavioral things due to neurological differences in the brain. There you go. That was a really interesting, awkward intro. Anyway, let's move on with the video. So I listed down five of the most interesting ones um, that would appear in toddlers because we, we talk on this channel a lot about adults with autism, we talk about children, but we never really talk specifically about toddlers. And I wanted to do this video about toddlers because I feel like there's some really good information that is sometimes missed, you know, when we talk about toddlers. So here you go. Dan has prepared for you five amazing uh, traits of Asperger's symptoms in toddlers just for you. All right, okay, so let's go through it one by one. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is independent play. Now, children on the autism spectrum will have difficulty interacting with other children. You know, so if you're in a, in a situation where there's kids playing, there's a bunch of kids, you take them to a party or they're in preschool or whatever, uh, and there's a bunch of kids running around, now, the kid uh, on the autism spectrum will differ from the neurotypical kids on the fact that the, the autistic kid will probably play on their own, which is called like an isolated play. Now, if they're playing on their own and they're just playing around and they're doing an isolated play, the other kids will be playing with like other stuff and they'll play games together and they'll, they'll, they'll kind of group together because they want to group together and they want to play games together. Whereas the autistic kid, on the other hand, will have isolated play and he may want to or she may want to play with the other kids, but they're not entirely confident in how to do that. And also, the other thing about isolation play or isolated play with children in the autism spectrum is that they won't know how to invite the other children in to play in the game they're doing. Because a lot of the time you could say that, you know, isolated play could be down to the fact that the kid on the spectrum doesn't want to play the games that the neurotypical kids are playing. And okay, I get that's a fair point. But then the autistic kid would probably want the other kids to play with them in that situation in, you know, if they're playing Lego or whatever they're doing. But how do they invite them in? And they can't do that um, because they have issues and difficulties with that. Um, I myself experienced this a lot in school. It was very difficult. Primary school, preschool um, was very difficult for me um, and I find that you know, it, it it definitely got easier. As I got older, I could learn more about it, but it was just very difficult to learn how to, to understand how to interact with other children and then also play with other children. Okay, so number two is non-responsive to name. Now, um, children with autism, a lot of the time, have issues responding to their name, and it's not due to the fact that um, they are going deaf, which is one of the ones, or they're just ignoring you. What it's actually down to is zoning out. And zoning out is when you kind of, um, when you're talking to somebody in the autism spectrum, or you're around somebody with autism and then they kind of suddenly just kind of go off and they're kind of staring into space and they're thinking about something and you're trying to talk to them like I do it all the time I'm sitting here I'm talking to my girlfriend and then I just kind of like this and then after about a while of thinking about something I'm like oh man what if we actually had an equal number of electrons protons and neutrons and they were all equal and how would this affect the kind of nuclear um, structure and the, and the negative and the positive interaction between that and the nucleus anyway so I'm sitting there thinking about this stuff and then Naomi my girlfriend she's like Dan Dan and then all of a sudden I just hear like a Dan I'm like, well, what is it? What is it? Why are you shouting at me? She's like, well, I've been asking you for the past 20 minutes. Like, what do you want for dinner? And I'm like, oh, shoot. I didn't know. I'm just like zoned out. Now, zoning out happens when you're a toddler and it just continues right the way through your life if you're on the autism spectrum. It's basically actually zoning in. It's not zoning out. It's zoning out of the world around you, but it's zoning into something that you're thinking about. And when that happens, the hyper-focus part of autism makes you, uh, gives you the inability to kind of receive um, external stimuli from the sensory input and the data that's 
coming from around you. I know that sounded like a lot, I'm really sorry, but basically that's how it works. So, if you are calling your kid for ages and ages and they don't respond to their name, you're like, huh, but they do respond to their name sometimes. This is definitely a hallmark trait of autism. Okay, so number three is a very interesting one and it's very common and hit that thumbs up button if you relate to this one, right? It's hand flapping. Now if you see kids flapping their hands and doing this, basically hand flapping is a form of stimming or self-stimulatory behavior which is very common in autism and it happens because they are um, controlling the stim because it is a repetitive behavior that they can control. So this will happen in um, maybe situations or events of nervousness, anxiousness or situations of happiness or extreme over emotions. Um, they'll use a stim to kind of balance out, or we will use stims to balance out. Um, hand flapping is probably like the most go-to one. There's loads of different variations, but basically just waving your hands up and down is a very, very common, and especially a present in toddlers uh, on the autism spectrum. And it will persist all the way through the teenagers, and maybe they'll never kind of um, change that stim. Maybe they'll hold on to that stim their entire life, but it's very prominent and dominant in children on the autism spectrum. And I think that like stimming in general is very interesting. A lot of the time you see kids stimming with like, like their finger maybe like this or they'll hold like an item and they'll stim the eye like this like really close um this is another form of stimming but it's almost like that same notion of like hand flapping it's just a different kind of variation of hand flapping but yeah hand flapping number three autism trait awesome okay so number four is delayed speech now due to the complex nature of autism um, we do know that it impacts communication and has an impact in the development of speech and can cause speech delay um, in toddlers so as a typical kid would be kind of like uh, you know progressing typically and their their speech would be coming along quite well in, in what you expect to happen a person on the autism spectrum may have delayed speech you know so their speech may be delayed they're not picking up language as quickly or as easy as the other kids and that's absolutely fine it will come maybe or maybe not maybe they'll be non-verbal but what I'm trying to say is that if they if you notice that they they will later uh, blossoming in their speech protocol um, and the lexicon didn't develop until you know a year after all the other kids uh, this again is a very high indication uh, of autism and actually sometimes um, kids can can be completely non-verbal um, all their life and, and then grow up to be non-verbal adults or sometimes they can be non-verbal up to a certain point in their life and then they can start talking maybe it'll be like 10 or 11 and then they start talking it's very interesting and that one actually fascinates me so much okay so number five is sensory issues now this one is a big big one actually sensory issues are called sensory processing disorder or SPD for short now this usually is co-occurring with autism and in fact I had this conversation today that you can't have a diagnosis of sensory processing disorder without having a diagnosis of something else so it normally comes comorbidly or co-occurring which basically means alongside of autism so if you have a diagnosis of autism you get this kind of bolt-on of sensory processing disorder all this means is that your senses uh, work slightly different because sense senses and, and relaying information from your brain to other parts of your body because it's it's giving you that sense is a communication aspect and of course we know that autism is a communication communication issue in the brain. So this is what happens. You may be hypersensitive to light, to smell, to sound, to textures, to touch, to environments, to heat. There could be a number of things. Like the, the tags on clothing can drive autistic people crazy. The seam of socks can drive autistic people crazy. I for one had an issue with denim growing up. I always had to wear cotton. And another one is that I get really hot if I get any, any, any um, uh, if I have to do anything, like if I if I'm have to think hard or if I have to get quite anxious about something, all my clothes have to come off. I have to see here in my underpants. I know, it's really interesting. If you see me doing DIY, I'm literally doing DIY in my underpants. It's not a great sight. Oh my goodness, but it's what happens. But the heat thing is a huge one because it's all of those things. But the textures and taste, they may have a really interesting kind of like dinner, uh, you know, reservations where they'll want to have um, the food separated on the plate. So cold stuff and hot stuff doesn't touch and sauces don't touch and dry things don't touch. There's a whole thing, right? Sensory processing disorder is very apparent and uh, it calls for fussy eating Fussy clothes wearing uh, and very interesting kids. It's not fussy, it's just peculiar, particular. And that's what I'll say about that. If you think this video can help somebody, please share it on Facebook and Twitter. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Leave me a comment. I read and respond to every comment and I'll see you next time, guys. Peace.